Good evening. I'm Helen Arcantu. I'm CEO of the YWCA of Northern New Jersey, and my pronouns are she, her, hers. Welcome to the Apart Talkback. I'm your moderator for this evening. Once again this year, the, we are very proud at the YWCA of Northern New Jersey to be one of the co-sponsors of the Teaneck International Film Festival's evening tonight. Um, our mission at the YW is to empower women and eliminate racism and create equal opportunity and we could not be more aligned with the Teaneck International Film Festival, the film festival with a social conscience. Um, part of our daily work at the YWCA is our Circle of Care program, which is a partnership with the New Jersey Reentry Corporation, a 12 week support group for women transitioning from the Edmund Mahan Women's Correctional Facility. And we are fully committed to helping all women succeed, which is why this film was so important to us. After watching a part, we learned that since the 1980s, the number of women in prison has grown by a staggering 800%. Women are now the fastest growing segment of the prison population and 80% of the women entering the system are mothers. Most of the women in prison today are there due to drugs or drug related charges. Almost all have faced an early trauma of physical abuse, sexual abuse, or a family legacy of drug and incarceration. Their stories provide a vivid picture of the challenges these women face when returning home, especially around finding work and housing and restoring relationships with their children. This evening, again, I'm so proud to be part of this, uh, sharing this important film to help elevate um, these stories um, and to help build awareness and tolerance. Um, please join me in welcoming our guests this evening um, uh, for our talk back, um, Ms. Malika Kidd. Um, Malika is the reentry program manager at Cleveland's Lutheran Metropolitan. Um, Malika was released from the Ohio Department of Corrections after serving 14 years for drug trafficking in 2015. Um, her last four years of her incarceration was at the Northeast Reintegration Center, where the programs that she was involved with gave her confidence, leadership skills, higher self-esteem, and the ability to work under pressure. Upon her release, she faced many obstacles from employment to housing because of having a felony record. She overcame those obstacles and was hired at the nonprofit organization, Lutheran Metropolitan Ministry. She started her career there as a kitchen supervisor of the groundbreaking first of its kind in Ohio culinary arts program, Chopping for Change in December, 2015. And the program started as a pilot with five incarcerated women um, coming to the program. Um, the program grew with students as well as notoriety. Malika's passion and advocacy has been featured um, obviously in this film, but also in newspapers and videos in 2018, she was promoted to the program manager of Chopping for Change. And in her role, she motivates men and women. Um, Malika lets them know that positive um, can come from a dire situation. In doing so, she has received accolades from several organizations, including the 2017 Reentry Impact Award from the Cuyahoga County Office of Reentry. As she continued to work with the Workforce Development and the Chopping for Change program to further her career in education, she obtained an Associate of Arts degree from Cuyahoga, um, Cuyahoga um, Community College um, in 2018 and uh, graduated from Cleveland State University um, in December of 2019 with a Bachelor of Arts degree um, with a concentration in nonprofit administration. Since her graduation, she has been promoted to the program director of workforce development. She's currently enrolled in an MBA program at Cleveland State University. Her goal is to continue to work in the reentry field and eventually create a nonprofit focusing on housing for women who have children being released from prison. She wants to make the road easier for those coming behind her. And um, she wants to use her advocacy in higher education, housing discrimination, and employment barriers um, in doing just that. And um, so grateful that you could be here with us tonight, Malika. Welcome. Thank you. Thank you for having me. 
So um, obviously we all just watched the film and, um, you know, we, we obviously have a sense between some of the film and what I just shared from your bio, but could you take us a little bit through your journey um, through the system and some of your thoughts about how it fails women? So um, when I first um, was um, incarcerated, um, there was no programming for those with a long time sentence. Um, you were on a long waiting list um, and those that had short sentences were getting all the different programming. And because of my time, my that security level was kind of high. And so you need it in order to get it decreased, you needed programming and it was very difficult. So I was just trying to take any program that was available to me. Uh, one was victims awareness, even though I just took it because I wanted to get my status dropped. I realized that even though I didn't have any direct victims that because of my crime was drug trafficking, following behind a guy and spending the money that he was making, um, I had indirect victims, including my family um, because they were doing this time with me. And so um, that helped, even though I was going for the wrong reasons, victims awareness really did help me. Um, some of the issues in the prison when I first came was medical. Um, even as I was going through intake, they said, you got how much time? And you sure you don't need any drugs? So they were like pushing drugs, which I didn't understand. Um, and I'm like, no, I'm okay. I don't need any mental health. I, it was just what it is. I got the time, so I just have to do it. Um, also with medical, um, being a woman, um, I was dealing with some uh, with fem female issues and they didn't believe me. And they were just like, we'll give you pain medication. And I'm like, no, there's something wrong. They wouldn't let me see a gynecologist because they met, that would mean I would have to go out somewhere else and they didn't want to pay for that. And the issue kept getting worse. And if you don't have family support, they do anything for, to you. And uh, so my mother was calling complaining. Um, finally, they said, well, we'll do something, but it was so degrading where they made me use my, uh, keep my sanitary napkin so they can see how much blood I was losing mm -hmm. and that, and handing it to them so they can see that I wasn't lying. And finally, after all that, and finally having to write it up, um, and my family calling, they finally did something about it, which there was a serious problem that finally, Um, just, um, noting here, we're just getting Malika back with us and there she is. Sorry, folks, little, little Wi-Fi challenges and Malika has joined us again. Okay. So my apologies. Um, yes. Yeah, so parole, even, um, when I got the job with LMM, they, um, you would have to go in even if I were just getting a travel permit and I was going out speaking in other states. Um, I would have to wait for like two to three hours. And I was fortunate because my job was was considerate and they understood. But what about those who didn't have that type of job and they had to wait there for three hours just to get a paper signed and they're not being nonchalant the parole office. So those were some of the difficulties that I dealt with in there. And um, when I was um, home, as well as housing discrimination. Um, so even dealing with that, um, you have to fill out all these different applications for, for housing, for an apartment. You have to pay for those applications and um, get denied because you have a felony background when they do the background check. Um, eventually I was able to get find an apartment. Um, it was on a Saturday when I filled out the application. So I really don't think she did the background, but she called me back in a few hours and told me that I got the apartment. However, once I got married and my husband, I wanted to put him on the lease. They told me that not only could he not be on the lease, but that he had, um, he couldn't even visit. 
and he had a drug trafficking case. I'm like, well, so do I. And they were like, were you somehow were grandfathered in, which I don't understand what that means, but that was discrimination. So some of those difficulties, it gets overwhelming. Yes, and, and it, it, it sounds like it's balancing the difficulties that were within the system when you were in it. And then as you came out of the system, you know, trying to, um, you know, with, with focus on reentry, you know, other challenges appeared. So it's, it's you know, really the, the, the balancing the challenges in, on both ends um, that, uh, that you're sharing. So what do you think is needed to give women the best chance at creating a successful new life once they are released from prison? I mean, you're sharing about some of these challenges for sure. And we saw, you know, so much in depth, you know, in the film. So resources um, when they are released. Um, I can also can say that um, mental health is a, a, a big thing and getting some type of counseling or therapy once you release go a long way. Um, I kind of wish that I'd started therapy when I first was released, but a few la years later I did um, start doing it. And I tell the ladies when they're going home, Ali, if you go for one day, one time, because you've got to unpack some of the stuff that you dealt with in there. Um, so therapy is a huge thing that I try to push. And even with family counseling as well, because your child is, someone, is something different. My son was three years old when I was incarcerated. And so um, trying to realize that he's taller than me now <laughs> and he's a young man. And I had to try to try to work with him to end the relationship as him now and not when he was a young child. And we needed to unpack some things because he had some anger about it. Me and his father were incarcerated and he was raised by my parents. So he did have and I wish we would have went to counseling when I came home as well. Um, other things. Um, transportation. Um, even like housing, housing is a huge thing and a uh, job. And what most women are the caregivers when they um, come home and most people want to give them their children back. Mm -hmm. So that that's in trying to get them and try to get a job is get overwhelming for some of them. And some people just can't take that. Yes. Yes. Um, mental health support is so key in, in, uh, you know, being able to have a supportive transition for sure. And, um, you know, having specialized programs that really understand the needs of women that are, um, you know, focusing on reentry are think are key. As I always say, you know, you have a heart problem, you go to a cardiologist, you know, every mental health person may not understand um, what, you, you know, that some of the transition issues are that you're identifying and sharing, which is why programs like yours are so important because they really are built around having a firm understanding of the needs and resources. So can you talk a little bit about Cleveland Lutheran Metropolitan and oh, okay. program there and that work? Because I, again, I, it's so important that we support programs like yours that are so focused in this area. So the Chopper for Change program, one of our programs there um, is the women. Uh, we have a three month, six month and 18 month program. So the three months is just the trauma informed care. We have licensed social workers to help them unpack some of those issues, um, dealing with any if they have any drug or alcohol. Uh, most women have trauma coming from prison, even before prison. Um, we help. So we have those licensed social workers for them. Um, we also have. Um, we help them with housing when they get home. Um, they, we, they're employed before they even are released. If they're not living in the Cleveland area, if not, we'll find resources to whatever area they're going back to. So we have um, resources and connections and partnerships with different restaurant groups. Um, we all, and then they can also get with our social workers if they go home and have more issues, they can still come in and talk to them. Um, we offer transportation and bus passes. Um, even during the pandemic, when restaurants were all closed, we were able, to, they were able to reach out to us and we were able to give them food and care packages. And some of them even volunteered because we still feed the area homeless shelters in the Cleveland community. And um, while they're incarcerated, we, we're big on family um, re, re, reintegration. And so we have family functions. So when they're getting ready to graduate from the culinary arts program, they get to cook food for their families. And like with Tamika, uh, she was crying when, when they had their family night. I'm like, why are you crying? She was like, this is the first time I'm cooking for my child. And we have Christmas parties. So we get donated gifts and they're able to write their name and say, this is from them and they're nice gifts, gift cards. Um, so we really big on 
the family connections as well. Yes. And I, you know, I can tell even from our circle of care group at RYWCA that that family piece is such a core part of our group and the work that we do with women as their reentry. They, you know, they want to be able to foster those relationships. They want to be able to, you know, stand in that role again. But as you said, it's overwhelming and there's a lot of support needed for them to be able to um, learn, you know, how to do it. And, you know, their families are at a different place than when they left. And there's a lot, as you said, to unpack, to be able to support um, being able to meet everyone where they are at that moment, as opposed right. to where they were in time. So that's so incredibly powerful to have a program, you know, like yours to be able to support, to support that. So um, we have some questions coming in that we'll, we'll definitely take. I want to, um, you know, ask you though, do you feel like, you know, now that you're doing this work, you know, um, and, and you're in this space, and I know you are spending so much time doing advocacy and speaking at conferences, and, um, you know, I know that uh, you have a TED Talk, which we'll be sharing the link to for our viewers to be able to, you know, be connected to. Um, do you feel like the outcomes for incarcerated women are improving? Do you think- Oh, we're most definitely. Positive? Um, Yes, um, we're even working with uh, the prison right now on a work release program where the women can actually get paid, um, you know, and make money and save money for when they do come home. They all have something, even if it's just for, you know, the first and second, last month rent, um, they'll have enough money to save. Um, so and so they'll be having jobs. Um, what else? They're, the program has gotten way better than when I first was incarcerated. Um, they have more opportunities for the ladies um, coming home. Uh, I know men institutions, they have like CDLs and stuff like that, but they are trying to work to get the women to be able to do stuff like that. Are you finding that um, you're able to get more support from the community around you for your work as well? Obviously you're sharing that the programs are improving and you're seeing better outcomes. Um, you know, are, are you finding that you're getting more external support for your work and, and empathy and growth and understanding of the needs and the support that, that you know, women in reentry really need? Oh, yes. So I was on, um, what is it, on the news talking about housing discrimination. And a lot of um, private homeowners were reaching out and saying, hey, we, we're willing to, to um, rent to them. Um, even when we partnered with a building downtown for the county, um, where the women took over the cafe. And at first the staff there were like, we don't want them feeding us. We don't know what they're gonna do to our food. And once they start coming and smelling the food and they were loving the food <laughs> um, and they were the door, the line was wrapped around the door. So the stigma is changing. They see once they get some kind of you know relation and see the ladies, um, they've done catering at different events. And they were like, wow, we're impressed. And they would give them, uh, you know, their story. And they're big and impressed in that. Um, we'd have a food truck now that we're working with, um, taking it around. And it's, it's getting some notoriety, realizing that everybody deserves a second chance. Yes. So some of the questions coming in, just so we can integrate a few of them, you know, as we're talking. Um, we have one question that's about you and your time. Um, and I guess, you know, obviously we saw some of this in the film um, with, with some of the other women. You know, how did it work with your sentence? Did you finish out your whole sentence? Um, did you serve, you know, how did, and how did that work in terms of you then transitioning into reentry is kind of the question. So I have the mandatory minimum sentencing guideline, which I was looking at, at between 20 to 50 years. Um, I ended up with 14, I'm sorry, 10 to 50 years. I ended up with 14 years. Um, it was all mandatory. So I wasn't able to be released early. Um, and I had five years of parole after that was mandatory as well. Um, so I didn't get to have that. Um, but I am an advocate for them. And, and when they're working at our um, organization, we have them helping us with the food that goes out to the shelters and that's com com considered community service. And if they have fines um, and they just look favorably on those community service hours and take away some of their fines from that. That's great, thank you for sharing that. 
Um, and so and other questions coming in about kind of programs like yours and, and you know, that, you know, we, we kind of were introduced to in the, in the documentary, you know, what is the recidivism rate? Are we seeing, you know, uh, in terms of, you know, return and, and the success rate? So over, we've had over 200 women within the last six years, and we have only had less than 3% of recidivism rate. And mainly it might be a parole violation or something like that. They left the halfway house or something. It wasn't like, it was not a re, uh, a new sentence. And so, um, you know, although we can put together some of the pieces, you know, what do you attribute that ability to keep that recidivism rate so low? Um, so a lot of them reach back out to me once they are released saying, Malik, I need help with this or Malika, can you help me with that? And we try to help them as much as we can. Um, we still keep a relationship with them after they are gone. And we even, we have, um, a crowdsourcing fund where somebody, they need help with their electric bill or their gas bill or rent, and they help us, um, get that money for them. And so we try to keep them engaged. And if they are in some type of trouble or they will reach out. Most of them. So being able to really keep that line of communication open is key in terms of, you know, being able to pull and keep them, you know, in a, in a positive place for sure. And you kind of uh, alluded to this a little bit just now with what you said. Um, one of the questions from the uh, from one of our viewers is how is the program funded? I mean, you're talking about um, different uh, opportunities that, you know, the, the women need to be able to, um, you know, keep um, you know, in a positive place, like these programs to help with, you know, these types of emergency uh, expenses. Um, how is the program funded? And, you know, I'm going to ask the question too, it's not here, but I'm going to take it a next step. How can people support the program even more so? Because we know that nonprofit organizations like yours, like Teaneck International Film Festival, like the YWCA, you know, really um, the community, you know, is, is the backbone, you know, from that perspective of keeping them going. So tell us where your funding comes from and tell us how we can keep it supported. So we are funded through grants, um, donations, um, and our, some of our um, social enterprises like the food truck. So that helps us because we don't get any funding from the state for those women. So we try to find other ways to um, compensate for it, even if the food truck donations and um, as well as grants that we um, write. And so like some grants, like when they were um, and they couldn't come out because of COVID, hmm. we were able to get some funding from Verizon Wire. Where we were able to upload our content on there so they can keep going in the program. That's great. So it's um, it's wonderful that um, you know you and I. What I uh, pieced together, I know we had a little bit of a Wi-Fi glitch there. Is that Verizon Wireless did come through with some funding, and that um, to get them on internet. I mean, to get them the, in the tablets and stuff. Right. Um, but it, you can go to our website, which I think you guys have put in the chat, and yeah. donate to the Chopping for Change program. Great, great. And I do encourage um, our viewers to you know really consider supporting the program. Um, it is very, it's obviously unique. It's something that we'd love to see replicated. Um, we can see that it works. We can see that it, you know, has an impact. And um, again, programs, you know, these not, you know, nonprofit organizations doing this important work really um, are uh, supported from, you know, viewers like you, as they say. <laughs> right. Um, so I know one of the questions that, um, came up too is, you know, uh, and I know obviously you had a piece, you know, in this documentary as well. Are you connected to any of the other women in their film? Um, you know, long-term, the question is, how are they doing? Do we know anything about their stories about where they are today? So Tamika, she got her CDL license. Um, I talk to her regularly. Um, we've been on a few panel discussions together. Um, so she's doing well. Um, her daughter's Bailey is just doing amazing. Um, she's on the honor roll. Um, Lydia, her husband is in remission now um, and she's doing well too. I don't talk to her as much, but I have been on a couple of panels with her. Uh, to, uh, Amanda, she kind of uh, lost her way a little bit. Um, I reach out to her. She tells me that the Bible scriptures that I send her 
helps her right at that moment. So she's trying to get herself back together. And I told her everybody makes mistakes. You just got to learn from them. And so she's a little bit embarrassed by that. Um, she reached out to me. So I picked her up and took her to church with me. So, uh, and that's another thing. A lot of the ladies um, will reach out to me when they get home and don't have a car. I'm like, yeah, I can take you to church with me. That's great. Well, what a, what a lifeline you provide, you know, for so many, for sure. So you mentioned a little bit about, um, you know, some of the, the women, you know, kind of showcased in the film and talked a little bit about where their children, you know, are today. And you shared a little bit about your son. One of the questions that came in is that, you know, hearing the stories and seeing these stories through the film, you know, the children are so impacted um, by the experience that their um, their mothers are having, and and it's um, you know impacted and in the, in the families. Um, what can we do? What is being done for the mental health of the children and of the families? Um, so, like I said, maybe some type of counseling. I know my mother um, and father took my son for some counseling to deal with his anger issues because, like I said, me and his father were not around, um, and I'm not sure how what they're doing with their kids. I know um, uh, Lydia's kids are more um, growing on her to be more into a relationship with her. I don't know if she had them go to counseling or anything, but I, like I said, I, I try to tell them that when they go home, get counseling, get family counseling, because that's very important. And that, that would help them deal with the issues. They might hide those issues, but yeah. And, and like I told them when they, were, when they would come to the program, just, this is a good program. Um, you don't want your children to see you doing your time in vain. Um, so everything I was able to accomplish in the prison, I would send all those certificates to my son to show, look, this is what I'm doing. I'm not just in prison doing anything. And so he's been proud of me even since I've been home and what I'm doing now, even though I didn't move back to Illinois where I'm from. Um, I decided to stay here and they're okay with that. That's great. Yeah. And one of the questions is specifically about your son and, you know, obviously he's grown into um, young adulthood, it says here, but, you know, you said what, 24. So yes. like, I have full fledged adulthood, <laughs> I guess not even young adulthood anymore. How is he doing um, and, and how has he evolved through your, you know, your journey? So um, when I first was released, he was in his senior year of high school and he didn't want to come and you know, make that transition to Ohio. He stayed there and did his last year of school there, which was okay, but I got to see him on weekends. But um, now he's, for, right now he is stationed in the Navy um, and he loves to cook as well. And um, so he is in Virginia Beach in, in the Navy right now. So he's doing well. Great. Um, so there's a question about the ban the box legislation. I don't know, is that something that you can speak to? So we do have Band the Box for hiring in the Cleveland area, and they mm -hmm. were trying to get that statewide. Um, and they're also working on it to be for housing as well. So they don't, you're not able to, you don't have to disclose that right there on the application. But once they get to do the interview with you, then it'll come up and you can just be able to say what you are. And that's get them in front of somebody before you just throw them away, because most people coming home from prison are the best workers. <laughs> Yeah. And give them a chance to prove themselves. So are you finding that that legislation is effective? Um, in Cleveland area. Yeah. Yeah. Good. Good. Even in our organization, we were able to hire a lot of the alumni. Um, we have one that works actually in our accounting department who had a CPA and she just messed up. But now she's in our accounting department. Um, we have several in our um, kitchen working. Um, we have some in our youth department. So we do hire the um, people returning to prison, from prison. That's great. So another question here that's come in is, um, if given the opportunity, and, uh, and I know you do spend a lot of time, you know, across the country speaking in forums, you know, similar to this, um, what kind of message would you have for a 13-year-old girl having trouble with her identity and at the risk of making some life-altering decisions? You know, what, what would you impart to her? it's not worth it. <laughs> I know you don't want to hear what your parents have to say, but they know it mean better. They're not just telling you what to do. They've experienced it. And that's what I tell my son. I'm not just telling you this just to tell you to boss you around, but 
it's it's a lesson that I've learned myself. And so just tell them to try to do better, be better. I want my son to be better than me. And that's one of the mottos I always try to like, live by is to be better. Yep. Yep. Um, so another question that came in now is are therapists or counselors or nurse coaches able to volunteer their time in your program or in other programs? Um, you know, how, how are they able to, you know, are you able to bring volunteers in and utilize them the folks that have those specialties? Yes, we do. We um, welcome volunteers, interns, um, and they come and help us with whatever specialty they have. Um, we have adjunct instructors who ha have like a master's in that um, field because like a, we have the program is now accredited for an associate's degree of applied science um, culinary arts. So we do have adjunct instructors and they come in and they teach the classes and the programs. Um, they have to be PREA trained, which is something that all prisons yeah. do. Um, and they are able to come and volunteer. We definitely can use them. Yes. And I know that, um, you know, here in New Jersey, our um, healing space program at the YWC of Northern New Jersey, which is their sexual violence program, um, our clinicians are able to go into the local program and provide counseling services through the PREA, um, uh, you know, policy work. So um, there, you know, there's obviously um, security measures and background checks and, you know, pieces like mm -hmm. that that have to happen. But, um, you know, if you want to be aligned, whether it's working, you know, specifically in the facilities or working with some of the programs like Malika's um, or some of the ones we have here, you know, or wherever you are in the country, you know, I'm sure that, you know, there's uh, there are, you know, plenty, not enough, but, you know, um, plenty that exists that you can connect with. Um, so just let's go back and showcase again for everyone about your program, where it is. I want to make sure that people know where it is. and you know, how many programs like yours, I mean, it's unique, we know that. Um, and I know that, uh, you know, you all have worked to try to make it something that can be replicated, you know, elsewhere and have tried to encourage that, you know, what kind of success are you having with that piece? And, you know, again, let's make sure we showcase for everyone where your program is. So it's the Chapel for Change program at Lutheran Metropolitan Ministry, and it's in Cleveland, Ohio. Um, we've had an 85% graduation rate. So, um, we're doing well with the culinary program. In fact, we are about to expand to the men's prison um, that's in the Northeast Ohio area um, and try to replicate that there as well. And, um, you know, I, I, you know, I'm thinking about, and, and obviously we can, you know, see this from the chat. There's so much interest about how to be supportive. Uh, you know, I, it would, I would be remiss in us leaving this conversation today without hearing from you, how can, how can those of us watching and are feeling so impacted, you know, by the stories and by the work that you've done and, um, you know, how can we help? What can we do? I mean, obviously we're, we're all somewhere, some of us may be close to where you are. Some of us may be elsewhere in the country, but you know, what, what should we leave tonight knowing how we can help and make change and support you and, and others? So um, volunteering, um, donating time or money, um, help change policies if you're um, in the judicial system. If you're in a criminal justice system, try to get people talking about changing the, their thinking of um, re re reintegration. Um, if you're, you have housing and you're willing to rent to those coming home, open up that. Um, if you are an employer or you can talk to your employer about hiring them, they deserve second chances. There, ninety-five percent of people in women incarcerated come home, and they're going to come home to somebody's neighborhood, and they need a chance. Well, uh, that's just a a great place, you know, to leave tonight's um, conversation. I know our our questions have kind of dwindled. Um, is there anything else that you'd like to share, Malika, before we all leave each other tonight? Um, thank you for this opportunity. I hope it reached at least one person um, and because one person can change a lot of people's behaviors and thinking towards those coming in home from the criminal justice system. Um, and I just hope that this encouraged people. Well, I, um, you know, I, I speak on behalf of myself and I comfortably uh, on behalf of 
I'm sure, um, you know, so many of us that are watching and, and um, have, you know, watched this important film um, to thank you and thank all the women who were involved in creating this documentary from being brave and being bold and sharing your stories. Um, you know, you've told us how we can help. Um, and there is something that each and every one of us can actually do here. Um, you've, you know, given us a, a, a great list and I hope that, um, you know, we each take note and, and step in because there definitely is support that's needed and we all have the ability to help. But, um, you know, by sharing your stories, you really helped create empathy and an understanding that we would not have had in any other way. And, um, you know, it's, definitely not only changing the lives of the women that you're working with, but you're changing our lives by broadening our understanding and our knowledge. So thank you so much uh, again for your braveness, your boldness, and um, your tenacity. Um, and so proud of reading and hearing, uh, you know, about your story and the growth that you've personally done and know that you will be continuing to impact and um, hopefully have all your dreams realized of your nonprofit and and other plans for yourself will be here uh, cheering you on for sure. Um, Thanks. <laughs> I'd also like to thank, of course, the um, Teaneck International Film Festival uh, for um, creating a space like this um, for uh, stories um, that are so important and sharing them with, with all of us. Um, and of course, the sponsors of the film, uh, Senator Loretta Weinberg, the League of Women Voters of Teaneck, and of course, the YWC of Northern New Jersey, you know, we, I, I believe, you know, I know we're all regulars and sponsoring films that are important like this because it's so important to share these stories. They are so powerful. Um, thank you all for joining us this evening. Um, we hope you're inspired. We also hope that you're moved to share this story in some way, um, integrate it into a conversation, you know, um, take the link that there's other opportunities to view it. Um, you know, please do so and, um, you know, make sure that uh, Malika's story and um, those of the other women, um, you know, are shared so that we all know how we can help and make a difference um, in supporting their reentry um, and reintegration into our communities in a healthy, safe, strong way. Thank you all and good night.